before we get into the sermon today, I feel like I need to give you all a bit of a prologue to what I'm about to say. We've had an incredibly happy and joyful service so far, and I pray that we can continue doing that. But I have to tell you all that sometimes I look out in the world and I watch the news or I read what's in the news, and God puts something on my heart, and I have to say that something. And today is one of those days. We've seen over the last couple of weeks a number of just really awful things happening in the world, and um, specifically, of course, I'm referring to the shootings in Tulsa and in Uvalde and in Buffalo. And when I first started hearing about these things, I felt myself being angry. But I wasn't angry, I mean, I was angry at people, but mostly, honestly, I was angry at myself. I'll be truthful in that. I was angry with myself. Because I felt like I had failed to be the hands and feet of Christ. To prevent these things from happening somehow. I hadn't done all that I could. That's my conviction, and it's that conviction that is inspiring me to share the message that I'm about to share with you all today. I pray that you hear it in the spirit of love that it's offered in. Y'all know, I hope, that I love y'all, and sometimes I have to say certain things because God puts those certain things on my heart. So with that in mind, I want to invite you to pray with me before we begin. Would you pray with me? Speak, O Lord, as we come to you to receive the food of your holy word. Take your truth, plant it deep in us, shape and fashion us in your likeness, that the light of Christ might be seen today in our acts of love and our deeds of faith. Speak, O Lord, and fulfill in us all your promises for your glory. Amen. I want to begin by telling you a story. One day, many years ago, a group of men gathered in a room. They sat down to meet, and they were just getting started with their discussion, when suddenly everything in that room began to shake. Glassware vibrated and clattered and fell to the floor. Carefully arranged scrolls of parchment came unraveled. Food and drink spilled. The room was filled with a noise so loud that the men covered their ears and scrunched up their faces in pain. And a ball of fire emerged at the center of the room and exploded out towards them like napalm, washing over each of them with a desperate urgency. That happened. And then just like that, everything was calm again. The noise went away. The shaking stopped. The fire disappeared as quickly as it had come. And just like that, Pentecost, the descent of the Holy Spirit, the founding moment of our church was over. Pentecost Sunday is the Sunday in which we celebrate the beginnings of our church. Without Pentecost, there is no Smith Memorial United Methodist Church. And on Pentecost Sunday, it's worth our while to look back to these beginning days, to the church in its earliest form, and to ask what, what we might learn from this, our shared past. Our lives can sometimes be a little inconsistent when we look backwards. We can view our own pasts, pasts rather, through the rose-colored glasses of nostalgia. 
sometimes to understand what it means to be the church, what it truly means to be the church, we need to go all the way back to the beginning. All the way back to the beginning. We need to go back to the days of Peter and Paul, to the days of the first Pentecost. Because it is only by going back to the beginning, by going back to our distant past, that we can begin to understand where we must go in our future. Were we to do this, we might find a church hard to recognize. As of Pentecost, the first Pentecost, the world's first church, the world's first congregation had just 11 members. It had no families. It had no kids. It had no children's moment or youth program. It had no potlucks or covered dish meals. It had no UMM or UMW. It had no senior luncheon. The church that was born on Pentecost had no paid staff. It only had volunteers, but those volunteers themselves had no real formal education. They had no real training for the work that they did. They had no notable gifts to speak of. They were not themselves extraordinary people. They had no budget. They had no tithing. They had no building. By nearly every measuring stick that we use today to measure a church's success, the church of Peter and Paul, the church of Pentecost, the church whose birth Peter proclaimed from that upper room in Jerusalem, was a miserable failure. Which begs the question, if we ourselves today are using the right measuring sticks with which to judge success and failure. Because those first 11 members of that first congregation, they were not just disciples. They were the disciples. They were the original 11 disciples. And their church, their small, underfunded, low membership, untrained church, changed the world. It is from here, from this first gathering of Christians, that Christianity exploded across the world. It exploded into the places that Peter listed. Places with names today like Iran and Iraq and Palestine, Turkey and the Balkans, Egypt and Libya, Rome and the island of Crete and the Arabian Peninsula. It brought everyone whose lives it touched. Jews and Gentiles, Greeks and barbarians, Roman soldiers and Roman slaves into a common shared experience of faith. Christianity was born into a world of poverty and slavery and oppression. A world in which social inferiors were expected to know their place. The earliest Christian communities were full of people who were expected to know their place and to not get too uppity. They were full of poor people and slaves and women, and the earliest church treated them all with the spirit of equality. Peter and Paul and the other disciples, the other apostles, taught these first churchgoers that regardless of where they were from or how low on the social scale they were, they would always have a place in the kingdom of God. Spreading that teaching, getting people to believe in it, not just for themselves, but also for others, was extraordinarily difficult. Oftentimes, it was dangerous. The early church was a place of division and divisiveness and argument and conflict because it dared to bring these different kinds of people together into a single room. 
It was a place of poverty because the only people who came through the doors were people who couldn't afford electric guitars and fog systems and fancy sound systems in worship. And it grew in membership at a rate unparalleled in human history, unparalleled in the history of any single institution. Not because of violence or power, not because of some incredible display or some great brochure. It grew because it dared to invite people to step out of their comfort zones and into something greater than their normal lives. Today, we have a similar opportunity. Then, as now, there are hurting people in our world. Then, as now, we have a world who needs what we have to share. There has been so much hurt in our world lately, so much pain. We've all felt heartbroken, I know, thinking about what happened in Uvalde, Texas, what happened in Buffalo, New York, what happened in Tulsa, Oklahoma this past week. We have all of us felt that heartbreak. That heartbreak is nonpartisan. That heartbreak is universal. And we all have something to do to solve it. We live in dark times. And dark times, by their very nature, demand light. They demand the light of the world be projected outward into the world. We can provide that light. We can stand against the darkness. We can do this. But we will fail in this effort if we treat this business of illuminating this dark world as business as usual. In this world of division, we remain one of the few institutions capable of pulling people into a common experience of dignity and grace and awe and mercy. Now, as in the past, the world needs us to keep faith with the promises of Jesus Christ and to share those promises with others. But if that is so, we must be as bold, as brave, as reckless as the original disciples. If we want to create healing from this division, if we want to create unity within our world, we are going to have to move towards that division, not away from it. We are going to have to confront it head on and in a Christian and loving way. If we want to make change, we have to challenge ourselves to do more good than little deeds at the grocery store or in the parking lot or in the McDonald's drive through If we want to truly be disciples, we have to take the risks and do the work and embrace the challenges that those first disciples embraced. It is impossible for us to do more than we can. Certainly, I am not asking anyone here today to do more than they can. But it is necessary for us to do absolutely as much as we can. A church can be a place of comfort and hope and ease, and certainly it should be. But a church cannot just be that. A church must find a way to be other things as well. We must challenge ourselves. We, all of us, myself included, must challenge ourselves to become something more than what we are today. Because if not us, who? If not now, when? Who else can share the light of Christ with the world? Who else can proclaim healing? Who else can say in confidence and in boldness that there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, neither man nor woman, for all are one in Christ Jesus our Lord? Who else can say that now?
if we're too afraid to try, then more innocents will die. And Christianity, for all of its promises, will seem to the world to be just another failed cult, just another empty idol, just another artifact to be swept into a museum and placed in the dustbin of history. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Do not be afraid. Don't be afraid because God won't let that happen. Don't be afraid because God is still with us. Don't be afraid because today is Pentecost Sunday and the Holy Spirit is here now. We aren't off the hook, of course. We've still got to say yes to God, don't we? But if this moment in time, if this moment in history demands that we ourselves grow into greatness, then perhaps this is the moment in which we must also, we can also, grow in our faith in the one who makes greatness. The God who shows up on Pentecost Sunday is not a small God, is not a comfortable God. All that terror, all that noise, all that fire are God's powerful rem- way of reminding us today that God is and ha- that God has never, has never been safe. Our God has never been safe. Our God has never been comfortable. Our God has never been easy. And our God has never asked us to do just the easy things. Just the things that we think we can do. Which is good. Because our world does not need a safe God right now. The world, this world, needs the real God, the biblical God, the God who demands that the faithful go out into the world and get to work fixing that world and who goes with them, giving them strength and courage and wisdom and judgment as they do so. Peter's vision of the church is not a vision of a gentle, comforting God worshipped in a gentle, comforting place at all times, but a God who raises up an army of Jeremiah's and Ezekiel's and Isaiah's, a God who is worshipped by those unafraid to challenge in their lives, to challenge the world to be better, and to dare to believe, to dare to believe that something better can come here, that we can be better, that our world can be better, that these tragedies that are happening do not have to happen, and that we can stop them. Our God is the God who refuses to let the church retreat. Our God is the God who empowers the true church not to refuse to rise to these challenges, but to step towards them. Our God is the God who creates the true church, which stays together in unity, not by avoiding hard things, but by staying so full of faith and love that all God's servants, the young and the old, the men and the women, the rich and the poor, see God's mighty plans and participate in the joyful and messy and holy and difficult work of healing the world. The power, the strength, the wisdom, the love to change this world is in your head, and in your hands, and in your heart. Because God put them there. The challenge for you, for you, for all of us, for me, is to say yes to God's command that we use these gifts 
and to march boldly out into the world in faith. And yeah, as we do that, there's going to be some people who will look at us and say, you know what, Daniel, you have had too much wine, sir. There's going to be people who will say that our naive belief in the reality of a better world is simply a fit of drunkenness. That's because courage and audacity and hope, those things look like drunkenness to the skeptic. To us, these things are just the fruits of believing in the God of Pentecost. So friends, I ask you to believe. Believe that the martyred dead of Buffalo and of Uvalde and of Tulsa have not died in vain because we will be inspired by their example. Inspired to make a better world in which these things don't happen. Believe that their deaths might inspire us and others once again to be disciples. Believe in God and believe in the power of faith. And believe in all things that the church of Paul, the church of Peter, the church of your great-grandparents and the church of your grandparents and the church of your mothers and the church of your fathers and the church of your sons and your daughters and of your grandsons and your granddaughters, the church of Jesus Christ, which is forged in Pentecostal fire, will not perish from the earth. Amen.